spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Or not. Happy Aloha Friday. I'm Yenji Denise. Thanks so much for joining us here on Spotlight Hawaii. Ryan has the day off today, but we soldier on and we have a very important and interesting guest today. We're going to be talking about COVID-19 and long COVID, particularly looking at families and children. There's a very interesting national study that Kapilani Medical Center is taking part in. So joining us now to give us some insights into this is pediatrician, Dr. Jessica Cossett. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Yenji. Well, it's so great to have you. Um, and I want to start out just with what you've seen in the last two and a half years when it comes to COVID and kids. You know, we hear so much from day one, really, that kids recover so quickly and that, it, you know, we had the impression early on was that it doesn't really affect children. Given how long we've now had the virus in our community, what have you seen with pediatric patients? So for the most part, I think children, um, as you mentioned, do pretty well with COVID, thankfully. And um, uh, that's what we're really glad about. Um, but there are children who experience more significant illness um, from COVID. And so what we are, what we have seen here is something called multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children. It's also called MIS-C. You might have heard about it um, in other venues. Um, and that's what we have seen um, a fair number of patients with that condition where they have to be hospitalized. We've seen young children develop respiratory symptoms where they need to come into the hospital, might need some oxygen, um, and may also just need um, fluids and things like that, fever control, may develop some pneumonias. We've had patients who've developed um, uh, just all, all variations of respiratory illnesses and may have needed to come in um, to get some of the medications that we've given for COVID, which include remdesivir or steroids. And then we've seen what you described, a lot of kids just um, getting it, having um, minor kind of upper respiratory type symptoms and recovering nicely from it. And when what you're speaking about just then was really the acute phase of the virus. What about in the months that follow? Um, it's so hard. You know, I have a three and a six-year-old. The six-year-old I can get a little bit more information from, but it's really hard for me to suss out. And just full disclosure here, some of our viewers do know that my son did uh, contract COVID about three weeks ago. He's fine. Uh, he recovered in about two days. But, you know, how can I assess whether or not he or, you know, how do other parents assess and doctors uh, whether they suffer from long COVID as children? So I think you ask a really good question and I think that's really the hope of our, our study. So this is a National Institutes of Health study being conducted across the country. We are one of 30 sites enrolling children, which I'm really excited about to have Hawaii as a part of that. Um, and through this study, we're really hoping to understand all the things that we don't. We know that there are two types of long COVID in children. Um, there's what I just told you about, which is the multi-system uh, inflammatory condition, which we're seeing about four to six weeks after someone has COVID, after a child has COVID. Um, and then all the other things that fall under long COVID, which we've talked about in the adult patients, but I don't know that we really understand what that looks like in children. Um, that's a whole slew of symptoms, everything from feeling short of breath, having a prolonged cough, being more tired than usual, having difficulty sleeping, mood changes, headaches, changes um, uh, in smell and taste. And so that's the part where I think recover, or that's what our study is called, um, the recover study is really to enroll patients um, ages seven through 25, and really get a sense of what their symptoms are following it. And the way we're doing that is through 
really thorough questionnaires asking them about all of their symptoms and doing it um, at different time points out from when they had COVID. Um, and if they're having symptoms that seem persistent, we're bringing them in and doing additional testing. So that might be EKGs or lung function testing. And I think those are the metrics that will really help us define what long COVID might look like. And then the studies enrolling healthy patients as well who may not have ever had COVID or even those who may be unsure if they ever had COVID and we can maybe help them answer that question. Interesting. And how how long is the study and how far into it are you? And, and also, uh, you know, how many children are you hoping to take part here in Hawaii? And I know you, you mentioned 30 sites across the country. Just so how broad is this? Um, it's a really broad study and we're really hoping um, to get it's going to be the numbers that are going to be really helpful in figuring this out. The more patients we can enroll, the more information we will get. Um, our goal here in Hawaii was to get um, 30, we, we do it by parent um, and child uh, pairs, and we were looking for 30 pairs. Um, and I, we are still enrolling. We started this study a few months ago, um, and we've had a really great response, which we're excited about. And I think why it is so important for us to enroll here in Hawaii is because, you know, we have a different population than the rest of the country. And initial studies around the country talked about the impact of children, um, the impact of COVID on children, and particularly described the impact in Hispanics and Blacks. Um, but we saw here in Hawaii that our Pacific Islanders, our Native Hawaiians were affected but we don't actually know that. A lot of that is anecdotal. Um, and that's where this study will be important and really getting enrollment from all of our population. And even just the fact that we have one of the highest concentrations of mixed race population in the country. I think our data is particularly important. Interesting. Um, and I know, oh, sorry. Yeah. And the length no, of no. the study. How and long the length are you of the study. families? Yes. Yeah. So it's anywhere from, it's a long commitment. It's anywhere from two to four years, but they're very spaced out. So um, the visits are about six months apart. Um, at the beginning, we, it's pretty straightforward. We have um, patients give us a saliva sample um, and uh, it's a fair amount of saliva. So that was a challenge for some. Um, and then we have um, a blood test. But what I love about the blood test, being a pediatrician, I know that children are nervous around that. Um, it's a test you can do at home. You actually get a kit in the mail. The technology is amazing. Um, you're putting a little device right on your arm, leaving it on for about a minute or two, collecting the sample and mailing it back. Um, from the saliva, we're getting um, DNA testing. From the blood, we're getting antibody testing. And that's where we can actually tell families um, you still have immunity from your active infection or it doesn't look like you had the infection or you were vaccinated and you still have immunity from that. And I feel like that's really inf interesting information that people wanna know. So there are benefits from doing the study and getting all of this information. Yeah, and, and let's talk a little bit about vaccines because we know that they are available for children. In, in my own case, you know, we'd signed up for Pfizer because it was the first available. And yes. unfortunately, he only got two of the three shots before he caught COVID, which was a bummer. But, uh, you know, he's still continuing on that course and we'll have his third shot. But I'm interested to know there hasn't been this uptake in the super young uh, pediatric population that a lot of folks were hoping for. Do you see a difference in your own uh, in your own patients between the kids who have been vaccinated and those who haven't in terms of outcomes? Um, absolutely. And the age group that we really saw that difference in was um, kind of the older kids, the school age and uh, teenagers. And definitely we only saw them, um, and this may be different across the country, but here in the multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children, um, all of our patients were unvaccinated who got that. And that's a significant disease where often children are ending up in an ICU setting. And um, it really, you know, as you point out, even though your son received two of the shots, he recovered quickly. And perhaps that speaks to the fact that those two um, vaccines did play a role and have an effect and make his course less severe um, than if he hadn't received any at all. 
Interesting. And in the patients that you're seeing, are, are you able to identify long COVID in kids? Let's take the, the MISC symptoms out of this and, the, and that diagnosis out of this. But, you know, when you're talking about fatigue, I mean, <laughs> my kids are tired sometimes. I don't know. And, and general ir irritability. I mean, like, how do you gauge those, those things in children, especially, I mean, even if you take the seven plus uh, yeah. who, you know, ostensibly can articulate how they're feeling. How do you separate just, you know, oh, they're just kids or, oh, they had COVID? So, um, you know, I think, I think it's a challenge, right? And we're all sort of hypersensitive to this now. There's all this information about long COVID. Um, but the definition is that it's a symptom that persists beyond four weeks from when they had COVID. So to start with, that's an important thing. Um, but then it's really, I think parents have that intuition and you know when your child, when there's something lingering, there's something not quite right. And that's where we would encourage you to talk to your pediatrician. We are seeing um, our infectious disease specialists getting referrals for these. They tend to be more severe cases, right? So it tends to be what, what people are really concerned about. So we've seen some um, with rashes and, you know, kind of almost like hive appearance um, to the skin, um, recurrent pneumonia, things like that, um, which may, again, be a, a symptom of something else entirely, but that's what we're looking into. We really don't know specifically, will it look the same in adults? I think on the adult side, they have this symptom list and we're using it for kids, but I don't know that we know for sure that there's that kind of overlap. You know, because kids have tended to recover quickly, there is this perception that it doesn't really matter that, you know, if they get it, it's not, it's a bummer, but it's, it's okay. Um, and there seems to be that sort of perception universally now that we're in the next phase of the pandemic and we see far fewer masks. What is your sort of feeling about where we are when it comes to COVID and how cautious we need to be, particularly uh, about pediatric patients? I think that's such a challenging question. Um, I think we need to be cautious because I don't think we know long-term what the effects of this virus are. It's been such a different virus than anything we've ever seen before in terms of, you know, these children that we did see with significant disease, kind of all the havoc that it wreaked on the body. Having said that though, I, you know, we've also seen the mental health impacts of the pandemic and masking. Um, we've seen speech delay in young children just because they can't see people speaking because people are always wearing masks. They're not seeing facial expressions. Um, and so I think that as we move through this pandemic, some of it is that we're, we need to learn to live with this disease. Um, but this is where vaccines play such an important role. And I do think um, even though we may think that most children um, have mild symptoms and hopefully they're not going to have long COVID or long symptoms of it. I think getting them vaccinated is is such a key um, part of moving forward in this pandemic, preventing it spread to everybody, including our um, older population, our Kapuna um, and our vulnerable population. So I think, I think vaccines are really going to be the key moving forward. We also have some preliminary evidence that um, vaccines prevent or make long COVID symptoms less severe in people who may be prone to it. But again, that's something that this study really hopes to look at because we're asking who's been vaccinated. We'll have that information about how their antibodies have held up. And then we'll also have genetic studies to help us understand who might be who might be that portion of the population that are more susceptible to long COVID and what is it about their genetic makeup that, that allows that. Yeah, and at this point, we know it's still sort of in its infancy in terms of understanding this disease, but what are the treatment options for kids who come to you who exhibit symptoms of long COVID? Um, so those who have mild symptoms, it might just be supportive care. So really young infants may um, just develop such severe stuffy noses and coughs that they, they are not feeding well, they get dehydrated. So it might be as simple as giving them intravenous, so placing an IV and giving them fluids. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of children do develop um, either pneumonias or, or lung disease secondary to it. 
um, and they require oxygen. And if they're needing oxygen, we'd like to prevent them from worsening and needing our ICU. And that's where we give a medication um, called remdesivir, which really came about during this pandemic, um, was previously used for some other things. Um, and um, in some cases, we've utilized steroids as well. Um, with the patients who've received the remdesivir, they've done well. And then also for patients who might be high risk, who have um, reasons to be immunocompromised, if, they're, um, if they get COVID, we can give that remdesivir before they have a lot of symptoms and hopefully prevent um, bigger issues. And then of course, um, Paxlovid is another option. That's that um, pill that people can take. And especially if you're high risk, that's really who we want to offer that to. Yeah. And in terms of if you think that your child has long COVID, uh, we had talked to Dr. Dominic Chow, who runs the long COVID yeah. clinic, clinic for Queens. And he said when it comes to adults who are, who are his patients, um, it's really just treating the symptoms as opposed to being able to treat long COVID itself. What, what are your thoughts on treatment options when it comes to that phase? Completely agree with him. There, um, at this point, it's symptomatic treatment. It's helping people through the symptoms. And I don't think we have um, a lot of options around that. Um, we do have some experience with some diseases that overlap. Um, and so that might be helpful. But again, that's what this study is going to look at. What, what are the symptoms we're seeing? And then from there, we hope we can springboard into how do we treat these and how do people respond? Um, I agree. Right now, that is really challenging. So while we may be able to tell someone they, they have symptoms of long COVID, we may not be able to do much about it at this point, which is really hard for us to accept. And of course, um, for patients and their families as well. Yeah, especially for parents, you know, you want to do everything for your kids. So that seems really tough. Um, I want to ask you about sort of more broadly in your work as a pediatrician. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a teacher and she said the learning loss is one thing, but it's the social emotional loss that has been so challenging for her. She happens to teach fifth graders. And so just saying that your kids are coming in and they don't know how to relate to each other in the same way because they spent so much time at home. I'm wondering what you're seeing in your own practice when it comes to the sort of ripple effects of the pan pandemic beyond, you know, the immediate health concerns, th these other issues that are sort of starting to, you know, show themselves. I'm sure the teachers actually have such a great perspective on this. I know um, when my own children returned, um, they described it. The principal said to me that it, it took a few days for kids to, and these are high schoolers, to get used to seeing each other again and socialize. Um, they had spent so much time socializing um, via text message or, you know, maybe FaceTime, but usually just playing video games with each other and things like that. Um, what we really saw as at the hospital. So I'm a pediatric hospitalist. So um, I admit children to the hospital. We saw a lot of mental health challenges. Um, and uh, we saw a lot of what, you, what you're explaining as down, downstream and ripple effects of um, parents losing jobs, um, food insecurity, a lot of um, things like that, that I think we'll continue to see even as we kind of hopefully are coming out of this pandemic. And um, children are really vulnerable. You know, they're resilient and they're tough, but they can be really vulnerable to these aspects. And so um, we saw just increase in, in our mental health crisis and um, just we just need more services for that in, in schools and in the community and, um, and support for these kids. And I think our teachers and um, frontline workers in, in our department of education and it's at the school level are so critical to recognizing these kids who are struggling um, and, and trying to get them in for the help that they need. Yeah. Um, going back to the study, if people do want to enroll, you know, you did say it's about every six months or so, uh, you know, for, for folks who think, oh, I don't know, that seems like a lot. What, what are, what is, the, can you tell us a little bit about the commitment that you're expecting and, and what are some of the benefits of being part of something like this and having your health surveyed so closely? What would you say to families? So, um, I, of course, made my own twin boys, her 15, participate, and uh, they've been filling out the surveys themselves. I think we were, you know, very interested to see what the results of their antibody test was. So that's, you know, a really interesting aspect. Families get that information back. Um, 
with the other testing, if there's anything uncovered about anything else, they would get that information, which, you know, knowing about your health is obviously, um, you know, being forewarned is being forearmed. And, and that really empowers families to be able to take control of their health. Um, but I think the conversations that um, families have around these surveys is really important. Um, in our house, um, as my boys filled out the survey, they asked questions. They said, you know, mom, I feel like I've been tired dude, you know, after this point, do you think that was COVID related? And then we've kind of talked through, okay, well, how much do, have you been sleeping? Let's look at that. Let's look at, you know, making sure that we're doing all the right things. And then let's see, do you still feel that fatigue or do you still feel this? And um, in most of the cases for, for my own boys, we've figured out it, you know, it was other things, but going through this inventory and really talking through it, I think is also another great way to connect with your children and be having conversations around this. And it's really led us to just talk about their overall health, which, um, you know, we are in a family of two physicians, so we tend to do that. But, but I still think the conversations have been really good. And I think that families can look at that as another opportunity to have these discussions with their children. I know you said that it's two to four years, uh, but will they be releasing the results sort of as they come? When can we actually expect to have some information coming out of um, all these surveys that are happening? So the antibody results um, you get within about six weeks of when you um, provide that sample. And uh, the survey results, that may take longer. Um, we're hoping, you know, they have given us bits and pieces of information. Um, for example, there there were some um, people across the country who had mentioned some mental health concerns. And so the NIH recognized that and said, you know, we really need to support families. If, if a child puts that information in, mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure that we have safeguards in place. Um, so I think there will be a little bit of information coming out here and there. Um, but I have a feeling it will be at least two years before we really get some concrete information. Um, you asked about the time commitment. The, the surveys take about um, probably about 15 to 20 minutes if you're really thoughtful in answering it. Um, and so and then the first visit is about an hour. And then if your child is looking like they're having symptoms of long COVID, you get put in this other arm where uh, of the study where you will then have um, your child will undergo an EKG and undergo um, lung function testing, which of course is so important and, and will be helpful to families to understand, you know, my child is saying they're short of breath, but okay, now we've done this EKG and it looks okay. And we've done lung function testing and it looks good or oh, we have concerns. And if we see that we have concerns, we will get that information back to their pediatrician and work on getting them the, getting them the care that they need. And so it's a great way if you have any of those concerns to have them enrolled and get that testing completed. And I know that you said that there's 30 sites across the country. So how much of this information is being shared sort of, you know, researcher to researcher and when can we actually expect to see some trends emerge? I don't know how long uh, you know, I'm not a doctor and certainly not a researcher. So how long does it take to actually um, see those trend lines and, and actually be able to make something of them? Yeah, so we, um, they're very good in the network of um, putting out news and research information. So they do um, uh, bi-monthly seminars where people are coming out with the latest information, what different studies have shown. Um, so I think they will be good about getting some of these trends out early, but I still think one to two years is really what it's going to take to really know. Um, and part of it will be how many patients do we have enrolled? Um, I think it's going to have to be in the two, 3000 range in order to really say, we've got some trends we can look at. And that's, what's been a challenge before this. Um, when a lot of these things were first described, it was, you know, in pockets of the country or in the world where they had 15 to 20 patients. And it's really hard to extrapolate a lot of information from that. And so the benefit of this study is if we get 10,000 um, parent child dyads, that's going to really help us be able to see what's, what's really there and what's, you know, what might be us being tired from a pandemic versus from long COVID. 
Interesting. Well, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to get your final thoughts this morning. What do you say to parents who are navigating their way through this and going back to vaccines and the importance of that? People are, you know, still, as we mentioned, you know, that the pediatric population, especially those under five, have really not seen the uptake that the government had hoped. Um, what do you say to families who are navigating their way through this right now? I think um, the first thing I would say is talk to your pediatrician. They are um, somebody you've established a relationship with, you've had long-term conversations with, and they're gonna be your best source of information. I think one of the hardest things of this pandemic is navigating information online um, and seeing what what is real, what is not. There's just so much information, but I think that the vaccines we've shown are safe and effective. Um, the children's doses are at a lower dose than the adults, um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. So um, they are they were dosed by, by patient age and weight. Um, and so I think we've run a couple of vaccine clinics at Kapilani. Kids have done great with it. Parents who've been there have been excited um, to be able to protect this younger age group. And I would love to see more um, uptake of that vaccine. And I think that's really how we move forward in this pandemic. And if anybody's interested in participating in this study, we would love to really have Hawaii represented and to really um, share our data with the rest of the country because I think we have important information about our specific population that we'd really like included. Fantastic. Well, if you want, if you are interested in finding out more, the study, I believe it's recovercovid.org where you yes. can try to register or register and uh, it's parent child cares. And it doesn't matter whether you've had COVID or know that you've had COVID or not, right? No, anybody can join and, and we can give you that information if you're not sure either. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, doctor. We really appreciate your time this morning and we'd love to check in with you in you know, a few months or a year from now when we start to see some of those trend lines. Thank you. I would love that. Thanks for having me. Aloha. Aloha. Well, great to hear from her. And she shared just such interesting, interesting information and really some of the challenges that come with navigating, uh, you know, treating young pediatric patients and trying to suss out, is this long COVID? Is this just, you know, uh, just general fatigue or kids going through all of the things that they go through. This study is so important. Uh, wonderful that Hawaii is taking part. It's through the National Institutes of Health. Again, recovercovid.org is where you can find out more about the study and find out whether or not you can participate. Uh, we don't know much about long COVID in children. We don't know much really about long COVID at all yet, other than you know that there is this laundry list of symptoms. Uh, that seem to affect a good portion of the population. If you missed our conversation with Dr. Dominic Chow, we encourage you to go back into our archives to take a look at that, particularly if you've had COVID yourself or if you know someone who has. It's very interesting information about long COVID. Um, wonderful to hear from her. And Ryan will be back on Monday along with Congressman Ed Case. Um, the Navy has put out a new sort of truncated by about three months timeline on the defueling of Red Hill. It's an issue that he has been particularly focused on. We'd love to get his thoughts on that and economic and other recovery here in the island. So please join us for a conversation with Ed Case right here on Monday at 1030. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.